Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. Can you stand up? We are gathering together unto him. We are gathering together unto him. Don't clap. Unto the Lord shall the gathering of the people be. We are gathering together unto him, unto him. We are gathering together unto him, unto the Lord. We are gathering together unto him, unto the Lord. Shall the gathering all the people be we are gathering together unto him unto Christ we are gathering together unto Christ we are gathering together God dream of his people be. Just once more we are gathering together unto him. We are gathering together unto him. Unto the Lord shall the gathering of the people be. We are gathering together unto him. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you as we gather unto you tonight. We thank you because of your word. We thank you because of this revelation. We thank you because of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you because he is a worthy one. And as he comes to take the book, the book of the possession of the whole earth, we rejoice with the angels of God and the raptured, redeemed souls in heaven. We rejoice with every one of them. And we say, worthy is the Lamb to take the book. He was slain. He redeemed us he redeemed all from our sins. And now we're going to reign with the Lord forever and ever. Tonight we come together at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're asking for well, the Holy Ghost, you reveal your mind and your truth and revelation to us in Jesus' name. We we'll pray, Lord, you give us the key of understanding so that your word will be made plain, clear to everyone in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Thank you. God bless you. Be seated. We're coming and study tonight to Revelation chapter 5. We, stud we studied the first part of chapter 5 in our last study. And I want to remind you that the church at this time now, that is in chapter 5, is already in heaven. At the end of chapter 3, the rapture are taking place. And the people of God, redeemed, they have been raptured into heaven. And they are represented by the 24 elders. And we see them around the throne of God. But now in chapter 5, something special is happening. From chapter 5 verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne. A book written within and on the back side. Sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice. Who is worthy to open the book. And to lose the seals thereon. In our last study we saw the centrality. The significance. The importance of this book in the hand of the almighty God. But that book containing all the title deeds of the earth. Because you understand the earth is the Lord's. And the fullness thereof. But the devil, the usurper, the intruder. He had come, he had taken the world over. That's why, why when he was talking to Jesus Christ, when Jesus was tempted, he said, all the world, the kingdoms of the world, they are delivered unto me. 
I will give it to whomsoever I will. He wanted the Lord Jesus Christ to bow down, to worship him, so that he'll be able to give him the whole kingdoms of the world. But Jesus said, you will worship God, only God will you worship. Now the time has come when Christ the one that is heir to the kingdom, the one that the Father has accepted, appointed, and chosen to take back the world. The time has come when he will do it. He will start opening the seals in chapter 6. But at this time now, there was the proclamation, the announcement in heaven. Who is worthy to open the book and to lose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And there was nobody found worthy, not among the angels, not among the men, not among the religious people, not among any of the political people in this world. And because of that, in chapter 4, he said, I wept, John said, I wept much. Why did he weep? Because if there was nobody to open that book, to break the seals thereof, it means that the earth, the world, will remain in the hand of the usurper. It means the earth will not be redeemed, will not be given to Christ, the rightful owner, to possess. That's why he wept very much. The whole world had been, had been groaning. So that they are waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. And for the, um, uh, for the purifying of the earth. And for the taking back of the earth unto the Lord. And he said, I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book. Neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to lose the seven seals thereof. One of the elders told John, there's no need to weep. Although nobody was found on earth and in heaven and in the sea, in the whole universe, one has prevailed and he has come and he is worthy to open the book. What's his name? What's his title? He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He said, shall rise out of Judah. Unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Is the Messiah. Is Christ is the one that died on the cross of Calvary and was buried for three days, but he rose again triumphantly. And is now the root of David, and the key of the kingdom is now in his hand. He has prevailed. And then he said, I behold, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four bees, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. Think about that. In verse 5, it was the lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah that had prevailed. But now when John looked and beheld, it was not a lion, it was a lamb. Because it was, a it was the lamb that gave his life for us. Behold, the lamb of God that gives his life for the redemption for the sins of the world. That is to take away the sins of the world. And because it was the lamb the sacrificial lamb, the paschal lamb, the one that shed his blood so that we can be redeemed. He has now become the king and the lord and the lion and the mighty one. He says, behold, I saw, stood a lamb that had been slain. Yes, he was slain. He was meeting. He died for our sins. Having seven horns, that's the totality of power, the perfection of power, the fullness of power, the completeness of power. You understand? The animals use their horns for power and strength to fight. And here it says that he had seven horns. Seven, I told you before, and I'm telling you again, is the number for perfection, for completeness, and for fullness. And it says he has a totality of power. And seven eyes, that means insight. That means knowledge. That means enlightenment. That means it's omniscient because he has the fullness of knowledge and revelation. And it says it was given by the Spirit. Spirit of God, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. The seven spirits of God, I told you before, there's only one spirit. But when it says the seven spirits of God, it's talking about the fullness of the oppression of the spirit of God. In Isaiah chapter 11, reading from verses 1 and 2. Isaiah chapter 11, reading from verses 1 and 2. You see the significance of the sevenfold manifestation of the oppression of the Spirit of God. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of its roots. That's talking about Jesus Christ, 
who is the root of David. And now it says, and the spirit of the Lord, number one, shall rest upon him. Two, the spirit of wisdom. Three, the spirit of understanding. Four, the spirit of counsel. Five, the spirit of might. And six, the spirit of knowledge. Seven, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. He possesses the fullness of the spirit. That's why it says in Revelation chapter 5, reading in verse 6, that he had the seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came. That's Christ. And he took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. That's where we are today. Because when the, when the Christ, the Lamb, received that book from the hand of the Almighty God, there was universal praise, universal worship, and universal adoration because of his unique worthiness and exaltation above all in the universe. He's been exalted. And because of that exaltation, that's why the whole of heaven and the whole of the earth and the whole universe burst into a shout of praise and glory, adoration. When he took that book, the possession of the inheritance which he had purchased is about to be reclaimed from the usurper as he comes forth to receive the seven seals scroll concerning the title deed. It's about to unfold the latter day, the last day events as he takes over the universe. The scroll was in the right hand of God Almighty who sits on the throne of the universe. A search was made to know who is worthy, who is able, who is mighty enough to break the seals of the scroll. When no one was found, as I read it to you now in Revelation chapter 5, when no one was found to have the ability to open the scroll, John wept much, wondering whether the usurper will reign forever, wondering whether Christ the heir will ever inherit by with what rightfully belongs to him, wondering whether the redemption of the earth will ever be realized. And John was comforted and reassured that the worthy one has been found, Christ the Lamb of God, the land of the tribe of Judah, and the root of David, the Messiah, our Redeemer, the Lamb that was slain. He was standing, he was alive, because after he died, he rose from the dead to die no more, ready to take that scroll, the risen Christ, strong, mighty, and wise, exalted above all, came and took the seven sealed scroll. The moment, that moment, is the most significant moment in the future history of the earth. So, that's the reason why heaven and earth and the angels and the redeemed men break forth into praise, into worship, into adoration of the Lamb. This is the moment that all of heaven, all of earth have been waiting for. Let me read the rest of the chapter to you. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. And when you are taking the book, that is when he Christ, when he the Messiah, when he our Redeemer, when he the one that has prevailed, when he the only one that is worthy when you are taking the book, the four beasts, that's the four living creatures, and the four and the twenty elders, the representatives of the church, redeemed and raptured already in heaven at that time, fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hast made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast that is the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice what is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are therein, they are in them. Had I saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts, living creatures, cherubims, said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders, representing the whole church, fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. 
That's what we're looking at today. And the title of what we're looking at today is, the topic is, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. I divide the passage to three parts. Number one, united worship of the Lamb. United worship of the Lamb. As heaven and earth, as angels and men, as they unite together and worship the Lamb that is worthy. Number two, unique worthiness of the Lamb. That is the Lamb that is so exalted. The, the Lamb that is to be worshipped. And the Lamb that there is no other person like Him. The Lord Jesus Christ. The uniqueness of the worthiness of the Lamb. And then number three. We have the universal worship of the Lord. The universal worship of the Lord. I come to point number one. In point number one, you have united worship of the Lamb. I read again from Revelation chapter 5. In Revelation chapter 5, reading from verse 8. And when He... Are taking the book. The four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to our God. By thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. You'll find united worship here. Because as we read in verse 8, it says, When the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that prevailed and the one that overcame, and the one that is exalted above every other creature, every angel or every man, everyone, anywhere. The exalted one. When you are taking that book, the angels of God, the cherubims of God, the extraordinary angels of God, the living creatures, the, the four bees, and the four and twenty elders representing the whole church, ransomed, redeemed, raptured, taken to heaven, already in heaven. What did they do? They agreed together. They united together. And they fell down before the Lamb. Having every one of them harps. You'll understand as you read the Bible that the harps are part of musical instruments that they use in worship. And in heaven, all those redeemed souls, they had the harps. And the angels had the harps. And they were playing on the harps. And it says they were even offering from the golden bowls, the golden vows that are full of odors. Those odors and incense, they are the prayers of the saints of God. When you are taking the book, you see these living creatures. You see the redeemed of the Lord. You see the representatives of angels and the representatives of the redeemed church in heaven uniting together in the worship of the lamb a redeemer when he took the seven skill scroll from the hand of the almighty god and he fell down before the lamb as an act of adoration and worship taking the posture of profound worship and then he tells us that there are these musical instruments in singing and praising the name of the lord i want you to look at some 71 so you'll understand that when he talks about those harps he was talking about the musical instrument with which they were really praising the lord worshiping the lord in psalm 71 verses 22 and 23 here he tells us i will also praise thee with the sceptre even thy truth oh my god unto thee will i sing with the harp I will sing with that musical instrument they have. O thou most holy of Israel, my lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing unto thee, and my soul which thou hast redeemed. It was because of the redemption. And because of that redemption, that is why they were praising the Lord and glorifying the Lord. Then he talks about the very fact that the company of angels and the company of redeemed people in heaven, they sang the song of praise. Because these saints of God, they were rejoicing. They had to rejoice because all the prophecies relating to the end of time and to the end of events, they take him back of the earth and put it in the hand of the master, of the savior, of the Messiah. All those things are about to be fulfilled. And then it says they were offering prayers unto God. It says they offered the prayers of the saints. I'll come back to that before I get to that. And let's see this uh, combined worship. 
as they worship the Lord. In Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 9. And when those beasts, those are the living creatures, the cherubims, they give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne. You see here in verse 9. The beast, living creatures, the cherubims, the external angels. And then in verse, in verse 10, the four and twenty elders representing the whole church in heaven. They fell down before him that sat on the throne. And they worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. And cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things. For thy pleasure they are and were created. You'll see there the united worship of both the angels and the men in heaven. How they worshipped the Lord. You understand that Jesus Christ is God. The reason he is God is that he accepts worship. Because when John tried to worship the angel that signified and revealed all these things to him in the book of Revelation, the angel said, no, you cannot worship me. I'm just a servant like yourself. But when the lamb had taken the book, he was worshipped by both angels and men in heaven. And that wasn't usurping the authority of the almighty God because Jesus Christ himself is God. In John chapter 5 verse 23, John Chapter 5, verse 23, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. You see that? All men should praise the Son, even as they praise the Father. All men should worship and adore the Son, even as they praise and worship and adore the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which has sent him. Therefore, we understand that we can worship the Lamb. We can worship the Lord Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter 15. Revelation chapter 15, reading from verse 2. Revelation chapter 15, verse 2. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God, instruments again of worship, instruments of singing, instruments accompanying the singing of the redeemed souls in heaven. In verse 3, and they sang, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of the saints, who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name, for thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are manifest. Then we come back to Revelation chapter 5. As these redeemed souls, as well as the angels, extraordinary angels of God, the cherubims, the living creatures called the beasts here, or the translation of King James Version, as they worship the Lord unitedly together. We're told something about it in, in this verse 8. It says every one of them having harps and golden verse full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. The prayers of saints. I want you to remember that they're already in heaven. Those saints are already in heaven. But then it says they were offering the incense or the veil with the odors coming out of it after they put fire on the incense. And they were offering it up as prayers of the saints. I want you to understand that whenever the incense was going up before the Lord, it was a mark of the prayer because it was associated with the prayer of the people being offered Unto the Lord. If you look in the Psalms, in Psalm 141, Psalm 141, verse 2, let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense and the lifting up of my hands as an evening sacrifice. But the question is, what kind of prayer were these angels offering to the Lord? Because it's not their own prayer, it's a prayer of the saints. Is a prayer that the saints have prayed from generation and generation and generation behind. And now God was about to answer that prayer. You say, what kind of prayer is that? Let me tell you, it is not the prayer for healing. Because they are already in heaven. 
and there is no sickness in heaven. It's not the prayer to deliver them from their troubles and trials because they're in heaven already and there are no tears and there is no sorrow and there is no suffering and there is no persecution in heaven. And it is not uh, the prayer of provision or provide for me. Do this for me. I'm claiming your promises. That's not the kind of prayer. Because this says the redeemed of the Lord, they're already in heaven. And they're not praying for earthly provisions anymore. It's not the prayer for children. It's not the prayer for a wife. Because in heaven, they neither marry nor give in, nor give in marriage. They are the redeemed of the Lord as the angels of God. What kind of prayer are they? What they offering unto the Lord is a prayer that the saints have prayed and prayed and prayed. And it appeared that it waited because the time of the answer had not come. Let me show you in the Bible in Second Samuel chapter 7. In Second Samuel chapter 7, I'm reading to you from verse 25. Second Samuel chapter 7, I'm reading to you from verse 25. Here David was praying, and the prayer he was praying related not only to that time, but related to the future. And here is a prayer in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 25. And now, O Lord God, the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his, his house, establish it forever and do as thou hast said. The Lord had given the promise to David that he'll give him a son. And that son will reign upon the throne. And that throne will be forever and ever. It was not fulfilled in Solomon because Solomon did not reign forever and ever. But the son of David, Jesus Christ, is the one to reign forever and ever. And David prayed this prayer. David said, O Lord, do as thou hast said. And establish that kingdom forever and ever. It was about to be fulfilled under the prayer they were offering unto the Lord. Look at Psalm 7. In Psalm 7, I'm reading to you from verse 9. For you to understand the kind of prayer that those angels were offering before the Lord. Because it says they are the prayers of the saints. In Psalm 7, reading from verse 9. Psalm 7 verse 9. Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end. The wickedness of the wicked has not come to an end now. But then at the time when Jesus takes that book and he begins to open the scroll and he, be he brings the great tribulation upon the earth. It is to stop the wickedness that has continued for generations. And here is a prayer that the people of God have been praying. They have been concerned for the cruelty, for the wickedness in this world. Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end. But establish the jaws for the righteous God tries their hearts and the reins. Look at chapter 9 of the Psalms. Psalm 9 verse 19. It says Arise, O Lord. Let not man prevail. Let the heathen be judged in thy sight. That's a prayer. And at this time now the angels were offering that prayer that the saints of God have prayed over the generations. They are, they are now offering it to God. And they're saying, O God now that the Lamb has taken the scroll. The lamp has taken the book. All the prayers of the saints of God, we offer it before you now. In verse 20, put them in fear. O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. In the time of the great tribulation, the nations will know themselves that they are ordinary men. They are, they are not God. Psalm 31. In Psalm 31, I'm reading to you from verse 18. Psalm 31 from verse 18. Let the lying leaves be put to silence. Oh, you know, that's prayer. But the lying leaves are not put to silence today. Liars are still lying. And until the rapture of the church, when the church will be taken away, the liars will see the lying. But then during that time of the great tribulation, and Jesus Christ pours out his wrath and indignation. And he begins the judgment of this earth. And then eventually all lies shall be cast into the lake of fire. Let lying leaves be put to silence. Which speak grievous things proudly and contemptuously against the righteous. Oh how great is thy goodness. Which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee. Which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. Thou shalt hide them in a secret of thy presence from the pride of man. 
Well, the church will be raptured. The church has been raptured in chapter 5. And they are hidden in the presence of the Lord. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. You see, that's the prayer the saints have been praying. And as the saints have been praying that prayer, uh, they have been expecting that uh, these uh, will be fulfilled. And they have waited until that time. And now the angels are offering those prayers of generations of the ages. They are offering it before the Lord. In Psalm 72, Psalm 72, reading from verse 19. It says in 72 verse 19, And blessed be his glorious name forever. Let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. It has not happened. It's about to happen. When Jesus takes that book from the hand of the Father, of the Almighty God, and then the angels will burst into acclamation and praise and worship and adoration. And then they will offer. They will, remember the, they will remind the Almighty God. The prayers that the saints of God have been praying all over the generations. And they have been praying, Oh Lord, let the whole earth be filled with your glory. And then it says in verse 20, the prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. You see then the prayers they have been praying in Isaiah chapter 64. Isaiah chapter 64. I'm reading from verse 1. It says, Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, and that the mountains will flow down at thy presence. That has not happened, but it's about to happen because the saints, this is the prayer they were praying. And as when the melting fire burn it, and the fire causes the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. That's a prayer the saints have been praying. When thou didst terrible things, which we look not for, thou camest down, and the mountains flowed down at thy presence. You see, the Old Testament saints alone, because I've been reading to you from the Old Testament, that have been praying, and then those prayers now are being offered to the Lord. No, it's not only the Old Testament people. Look at Matthew chapter 6. How the saints of God, in the New Testament, how they have been praying as well. In Matthew chapter 6, reading from verse 9, after this man and therefore pray ye, Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. How many times, how many saints, how many children of God, how many church people have prayed this prayer for hundreds and centuries, uh, for hundreds of years, and yet it has not happened. Let thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. That's the prayer the saints have been praying. And in every denomination, in every church, many people have prayed that prayer for many, many times, and yet it has not happened. And that's why it's saying now this prayer, that the kingdom of God will come, and that God's name will be honored on the whole earth, and then the will of the Father will be done on earth as it is in heaven, it's about to be answered. That's why it says, when Jesus took that book, when the Lamb of God took that book, heaven burst into praise, into, wo into wonder, into worship, into adoration. And he offered the prayers of generations before the Lord. Didn't Jesus speak about that in Luke chapter, chapter 18? Luke chapter 18, in verse 7, Shall not God avenge his own elect? which cry day and night unto him, though he be long with them. Oh, Jesus said, he knows the saints have been praying. And they have been praying that the wickedness of the wicked will be put to an end. And that all the line leaves will be stopped. And that all the things the people of the world are doing, that God should bring judgment so that the righteous people of God will rejoice. He says, will not God avenge his son elect? which cry day and night unto him, though he be along with them, I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, aha, uh -huh, that prayer is tied to the coming of the Lord. That prayer is tied to the time when Jesus will take the possession of the earth. It says, when the Son of Man shall come, when he cometh, will he find faith on the earth? And so, you understand the kind of prayer we're talking about. We're looking at Romans chapter 10. In Romans chapter 10, it tells us in verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. That prayer has not been answered yet. My prayer to God is that Israel as a whole nation might recognize Jesus as their Messiah. 
might recognize Jesus as a Savior and that they will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. It has not been answered. That's the prayer of the saints. But that prayer is going to be answered if you look at chapter 11 of um, Romans, verse 26. Romans chapter 26, uh, chapter 11, verse 26. And so all Israel shall be saved. The time is coming. All Israel shall be saved. How do we know that prayer is answered? When you get to chapter 7, you begin to realize that 144,000 of the children of Israel from every tribe, 12,000 from every one of the 12 tribes, they were sealed. And then the mark of God was put upon them. And they belonged to the Lord. And they could not be hurt during the time of the great tribulation. You read Zechariah's and then it says, after the judgment had fallen, then the people of Israel, they will cry unto the Lord and they will be saved. But it has not prayer has not been answered. Come back to Revelation chapter 5. In Revelation chapter 5, looking at verse 8, and when you are taking the book, the four beasts, the four living creatures, the cherubims, the extraordinary angels, and the four and twenty elders, they fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them halves and golden verse full of odors, which are the prayers of of the saints. Now you understand what those prayers are and they will be answered. The kingdom will come. Wickedness will come to an end and then the people of God, the saints of God will be exalted to sit together in heavenly places with the Lord Jesus Christ in reality. And in verse 9 they sung a new song saying, thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. It tells us that uh, the people here that, was, that were singing to the Lord, that were singing this new song unto the Lord, they were the redeemed of the Lord. The redeemed of the Lord. When I say the redeemed of the Lord, I'm not referring to a denomination. I'm referring to all the people that have been ransomed and purchased by the blood of the Lamb. I'm referring to the people who have been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. When he talks about being redeemed, what does that mean? Look at your Bible. When it says we're redeemed in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. That's the redemption there. The forgiveness of sin. Your sins are taken away as you repent. And you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that he died for you on the cross of Calvary. All your iniquity, everything is taken away so that sin does not have power, does not have authority over you anymore. In Titus chapter 2 verse 14. Titus chapter 2, verse 14, who gave himself for us, that he might redeemed, redeem us from all iniquity and pray found to himself, a peculiar people zealous of good works. That is, he has redeemed us from all iniquity and from all our sins, the guilt of sin that's gone, and the power of sin that's broken, the pressure and the authority of sin upon the life of the believer has been broken because Jesus Christ gave himself and he redeemed us. He purchased us. He took us out of all iniquity and purified us unto himself, a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And he says it's through the blood of Jesus. If you turn back to Revelation chapter 5, thou art, thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. It's through the blood of the Lamb that that took place. The blood of the Lamb. You know what the blood of Jesus does in our lives? If you look at First John chapter 1 verse 7. First John chapter 1 verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That's what the blood of Jesus does. Before you meet the Lord Jesus Christ, before you are born again, before you are converted, before you are washed in the blood of the Lamb, you are full of sin. You are full of dirt. You are full of uncleanness. You are full of pollutions. You are full of adultery or fornication or drunkenness or it is immorality or it is anger or it is uh, hatred or it is whatever, malice and all those evil things. But you come to the Lord Jesus Christ and you ask for the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb. 
You want to be redeemed. You want to be saved. You want to be forgiven. You want all your sins to be taken away. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. It is that blood that makes it possible for us to live a holy life, a righteous life. In First Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 15, it says, But I see which has called you is holy. So be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. How is that holiness possible? Verse 18, for as much as you know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. That's the blood of the Lamb that redeems us. It's not only that our sins are forgiven. It's not only that we are converted. It's not only that we are born again. It is through that blood of the Lamb we are sanctified. We are made holy. We are purified in the heart. And our lives and conduct and everything becomes purified in the sight of the Lord because of the blood of the Lamb. Hebrews chapter 13, reading verse 12. Hebrews 13 verse 12, Wherefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gauge. That's what the blood has done. That's why those sanctified souls, those purified souls, those people that are redeemed, redeemed from all sins, washed and cleansed in the blood of the Lamb. That's why they were singing before the Lord, Thou hast redeemed us unto God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and language, out of all the people, and we shall reign on the earth, because you have made us priests and kings unto our God. That's what the blood of the Lamb does. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20, now the God of peace, which brought, that brought again the dead from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. That's the blood again. The blood of the Lamb. Here is what it does. Make you perfect in every good work. To do his will. Walking in you. That which is well pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ. To whom be glory forever and ever. Let me have an amen. See, that's what the blood of Jesus Christ does. That's why those people were praising the Lord. I come back to Revelation chapter uh, Revelation chapter 5 and see what they were doing. Well, see what they were doing. It says in verse 9, and they sang a new song. And they sang a new song. Why were they singing? You know the reason already. And they are joyful because now the earth is about to be redeemed. They are joyful because wickedness is about to come to an end. They are rejoicing because Christ, the exalted one, is about to take the place and the position of power and authority. In Psalm 98, Psalm 98, reading from verse 1, O oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. For he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm has gotten him the victory. Isn't that similar to what has happened in Revelation chapter 5? Because his right hand has gotten him the victory. The Lord has made known his salvation, his righteousness. As he open, openly showed in the sight of the heathen. And he has remembered his mercy and his truth toward the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All the earth make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. Sing unto the Lord with the harp and with the, with the harp and with the voice of his psalm, with the trumpet and with the voice with the sound of the cornet. Make a joyful noise before the Lord the King. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof. The world and and they that dwell therein, let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord. For he cometh to judge the earth. You see that? He cometh to judge the earth with righteousness. Shall he judge the world and the people with equity, with righteousness? And that's the reason why they were rejoicing. And that's why we rejoice today. Because we know that Christ is going to reign forever and ever. As you look at that Revelation chapter 5, it says that it's doing, uh, the people are rejoicing because God himself has exalted the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the worthy one. And now he has come to take that book from the hand of the almighty God. 
and it's going to happen. You will be become part of that praise and worship up in heaven in Jesus' name. And while you're expecting that on earth here, you worship the Lord, you praise the Lord, you sing unto the Lord. I just look at First Peter chapter 2 before I go to point number 2. First Peter chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 5. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer spiritual, to offer up spiritual sacrifices. In verse 9, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people. For what reason? Why? That ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And as the reason, those saints of God in heaven and those angels with their beautiful voices, that's why they united together in the worship of the Lamb, of the worthy one, of the root of David and of the Lamb of God that was slain. Now we're going to look at point number two, the unique worthiness of the Lamb. The unique worthiness of the Lamb. I come to Revelation chapter 5 verses 11 and 12. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne. And the beast that is the living creatures, the cherubims, the extraordinary angels and the exalted angels and the elders, the representatives of the redeemed of God in heaven already raptured. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, what is the Lamb? that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. The unique worthiness of the Lamb. Now, when we say unique worthiness, that means nobody like him is exalted to such a position that no other person is exalted. As you look at Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, the unique worthiness of the Lamb. In verse 9, where, wherefore God has also highly exalted him and given him a name above every name. Unique worthiness. Nobody like him. Nobody like Jesus Christ on earth, in heaven, under the sea, in the whole universe. Nobody like him because he has had a name. He's highly exalted and he's given a name above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It tells us in John chapter 3. John chapter 3, the unique worthiness of the Lamb. John chapter 3, reading from verse 31. It says here, he that cometh from above is above all. Unique worthiness of the Lamb. Unique exaltation of the Lamb. And unique position of the Lamb. It says, he that cometh from above, referring to Jesus Christ, is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. All in verse 35, the Father loveth the Son and has given all things into his hand. That is that's his authority. And what does he do that no other person can do? In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, verse 12, what he does, what Christ does that no other person can do. Acts chapter 4, verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. Its exaltation is touched upon in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, reading from verse 20, the exaltation of the Lamb, the exaltation of Jesus Christ, the unique worthiness of the Lamb. In Ephesians chapter 1, reading from verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come and he has put all things under his feet and gave he has given him to be head over all things to the church uh, that tells you then that uh, this exaltation of christ is something real that's why he has this unique worthiness the word 
worthiness that no other person has. Uh, there's a passage in the Old Testament. And this is looking forward to when the Lord will come. Yes, it's applicable to the Father, to God the Father. But it's applicable also to Jesus Christ, the very Son of God. In Psalm 89, Psalm 89, reading in verse 6, it says, For who in heaven can be compared unto the Lord? You think about the Lord Jesus Christ, who in heaven... Is it Angel Gabriel or Michael or any of the cherubims or any of the ordinary angels who in heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? Among men, among angels, who can you liken to the Lord? That's why they sang, what is a lamb? That was slain and is worthy to receive honor and glory and power and riches and wisdom and strength and blessing. Now, as we look at all this, we we'll see it's not only the redeemed men, it's not only the ransomed men, it's not only the people of God who have been taken to heaven that were praising, adoring, worshiping the Lord, even the angels too. Look at verse 11. It says, I beheld. That is Revelation chapter 5, verse 11. I beheld. And I heard the voice of many angels, many angels, multitudes of angels round about the throne. And the beasts, the living creatures, and the elders, the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. When you read in the English Bible, you may not understand because it says 10,000. Well, in the, in the Greek language in which the New Testament was written, the highest letter, the greatest letter, the biggest letter they could refer to in their language was 10,000. So what they actually meant is this. They were saying the number of the angels was the highest number times the highest number. And then it says the multitudes of them, thousands of thousands, myriads of myriads, and billions and billions and billions of people, uncountable people. When you think about the angels of God, uh, can you count them? Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 22, talking about the number of the angels of God. But we are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Innumerable company of angels. And then it tells us, as we turn back to Revelation chapter 5, Revelation chapter 5, these innumerable angels and uncountable saints, they join together in a united angelic and, say, and saintly doxology. And they were saying with a loud voice, what is the lamb? that was laid to receive power number one number two riches number three wisdom number four strength number five honor number six glory number seven blessing can you see the completeness again because remember that seven is a number that gives you fullness and completeness and perfection and totality and it says here the lamb receives the fullness and the completeness and the perfection of adoration and worship in recognition of his unique worthiness the united voice of all the created beings say and shout worthy is the lamb and the receive for his worthiness is a sacrifice for our sins as a result of his redemption work he has mediatorial dominion over the whole universe in view of all that he is in view of all that he has done he is worthy to receive number one power that is power and authority power and authority to rule over all things not the first thing that was mentioned there as you look at matthew chapter 28 matthew chapter 28 reading verse 18 and jesus came and spake unto them saying all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth and here is the chorus and here is the singing of the angels and the men in heaven saying it's worthy to receive power the second thing they mentioned is riches as you look at um, ephesians chapter 3 Ephesians chapter 3, you will see that the riches of the gospel, the riches of the kingdom, and the riches of heaven, all are centered in the Lord Jesus Christ. In uh, Ephesians chapter 3 verse 8, unto me, who am less than the least of all sins, is this grace given, that I shall preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. The unsearchable riches of Christ. That means then Christ, because it's not the heir, is the possessor, is the proprietor of all things therefore is rich beyond description 
The third thing they mentioned in the attributes that he was worthy to receive in the song of adoration, in the song of worship, was wisdom. That is, eminent divine wisdom. Having divine ability to choose the best ends and the best means to accomplish God's own program and God's own redemptive purposes. As he talks about the wisdom that Jesus Christ had, remember the fullness of wisdom, the perfection of wisdom, the totality of wisdom, the infinity of wisdom, if you like. In Colossians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2, reading from verse 3, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That's the Lord Jesus Christ in him. You have hidden all the treasures of wisdom and of knowledge. It tells us in verse 9, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And we are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. You understand then when we talk about this Jesus Christ that he possesses all things. And let me just uh, remind you that this same Jesus is your savior. He is your redeemer. He's the one that has taken your sins away. If you don't have a father, you don't have a mother, you don't have a sister, you don't have a brother, you don't have a friend, you don't have a helper, you have Jesus Christ. And he's full of power. And he's full of strength. And he's full of wisdom. And he's full of everything you will ever need. He's full of riches. And then you can be abundantly blessed by the riches that Jesus Christ possesses. As these angels and redeemed men, as we are glorifying the Lord, they mention strength. Strength. That is, is worthy to receive strength. That is immeasurable strength. That is immeasurable strength that is manifested in overcoming the great enemy of man and the great enemy of God. He triumphed over death to save his own people. As you think about the strength, I want you to look at Psalm 93. Psalm 93, totality of strength, completeness of strength, the perfection of strength belonging to the Almighty God. In Psalm 93, verse 1, the Lord reigneth. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength. Yes, God Almighty. And yes, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, our Lord. He is clothed with strength. Wherewith he has guarded himself. The world also is established that it cannot be moved. The throne is established of old. Thou art from everlasting. How true that is concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. But then as we look at the praise, the song of praise that they were singing to the Lamb. Number five thing was the honor, unsurpassed honor and esteem for what he has done. In Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 17, the honor that belongs to Jesus Christ, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. In Second Peter chapter 1, verse 17, for he received from God the Father honor and glory honor and glory. He received that from the Father. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But not only honor, there is glory as well. In John chapter 17, the glory. John chapter 17, reading from verse 5. You remember the prayer of Jesus Christ when he was praying for the sanctification, the heart purity, the holiness of his own disciples. That wonderful experience that you get after you are born again. He was praying for his own disciples to be sanctified. And then here is part of the prayer. In John chapter 17 verse 5, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work that thou hast given, that thou gavest me to do. That's verse 4, verse 5 now. Now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Before the world began, Jesus had glory. Great glory, extreme glory, eternal glory with the Father. And he said, now, Father, I'm coming back home. Glorify me with that glory, with yourself and that glory which I had before the world began. And in verse 24, Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory glory, that they may see my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. And then in the uh, in that adoration that those uh, angels and men that they were giving to the Lord Jesus Christ, the last thing they mentioned there was blessing. 
That means unlimited blessing. Our Redeemer is worthy of all praise. The praise of all angels and of all men. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 19. Looking at the blessing that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is worthy of. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 19. For yet it pleased the Father that in him should dwell all fullness. It has pleased the Heavenly Father that the fullness of all blessings and the fullness of all glory and the fullness of all honor and the fullness of all strength and the fullness of all wisdom and the fullness of all might and the fullness of all power shall dwell in the Lord Jesus Christ. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. You come back to Revelation chapter 5. In Revelation chapter 5, you see why they were singing. And you see what they were singing in that verse 12, saying with a loud voice, What is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing? And now in verse 13 and verse 14, And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them had I seen. And what a surprise it was to John. Because when John was in Jerusalem, it wasn't the majority that believed. Only the minority believed. As many as they were in their thousands, they were still the minority, just like in our city here. As many members as we have were still in the minority that are praising the Lord, that are worshipping the Lord. And the majority of people have not yielded to Christ. And so it surprised John that when he got to heaven and he saw that things have changed, that the Lamb of God, that Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and the Root of David, when he took that book from the hand of the Almighty God, how he saw and how he heard that all of heaven and all of earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea, anything and everything that has breath, everything that in them is, had I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that seated upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts, living creatures said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders representing the redeemed raptured church fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. The whole created universe explodes in worship and praise to God and to the Lamb. All created things they unite in rendering honor to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All who are in heaven, all in the universe, all the universe with the voice of all parts from all parts of the earth round the throne and beyond the throne. They rejoice in ascribing praise and blessing and honor and glory and power unto the Lord. And the living creatures echo, Amen. They have formed it as the worship and praise pours forth from the whole universe. As the Lamb slain, risen, and standing, resurrected, and glorified, and exalted, as he takes the seven seal scroll, the whole universe enters into a state of profound adoration, waiting for the opening of the mysterious book. Angels and men, they know the secret is with God, and all in heaven, and all on earth, they know that on, that only one, Jesus Christ is the only one that is worthy to open the book. That's the reason they gather around and the most reverential posture awaiting the disclosure of the great mystery. And look at uh, as they all praise the Lord and worship the Lord and nobody was left out. I pray you will be there. I said you will be there. And you will sing with the redeemed of God in heaven. In Revelation chapter 7, reading from verse 9. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. And after this I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number. Let me ask you a question. If so, so great a multitude will be saved, that they count and count, they count 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, 900,000, and 1 million, and millions and millions of people, and billions of people, until they stop counting. And their jaws are countable. And they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. How is it you will not be among that number? Young people getting saved. 
men getting saved, women getting saved, uncountable number before the Lord of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb. Clothes were white robes and palms in their hands. If there are so many, why will you not be among them? And he cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, who seated upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beings, the living creatures, and they fell before the throne on their faces. And they worshiped God and they were saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever and everybody said amen in revelation chapter 19 revelation chapter 19 reading from verse 4 people just praising god heaven praising god earth praising god in the sea praising god in the ocean praising god everywhere praising god in the whole universe just praising and worshiping the lord in revelation chapter 19 verse 4 and the four and the 20 elders representing the whole church and the four living creatures the beasts the uh, extraordinary angels of god representing the angelic creatures they fell down and they worshiped God in united praise, in universal praise, that God that sat on the throne saying amen hallelujah and a voice came out of the throne saying praise our God all ye his servants and ye that fear him both small and great and I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters and as the voice of mighty throne saying hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. And the point I'm making to you from all these scriptures is it will be a universal worship. All earth, all heaven, all nations, all tongues opening their mouths wide and praising the Lord. And that wasn't strange to the Old Testament people. They were looking forward to the time when that actually will take place look at psalm 22 psalm 22 uh, you see if you begin psalm 22 you will see the humiliation of the lamb you will see the smiting of the lamb you will see the crucifixion of the lord jesus christ in psalm 22 verse 1 my god my god why hast thou forsaken me you see that's what jesus said on the cross when he died that was the time of his humiliation but before the chapter ends you are going to have the exaltation of the lord jesus christ in verse 8 he trusted on the lord that he would deliver him let him deliver him seeing that he delighted in him those were the people making jest and fun of the lord jesus christ when he was on the cross in verse 16 for the dogs have come past me the assembly of wicked men have enclosed me they pierce my hand and they pierce my feet i may tell all my bones they look and stare on me they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture that was the time of the crucifixion that was the time of the humiliation that was the time he made a sacrifice the lamb that was slain but he will not remain like that forever he was buried and he rose from the dead and he ascended to heaven and now he's, a, he's exalted above all people and all angels and the time is coming when all the earth and all of heaven and all the redeemed of god all the angels of god everyone in the universe will worship that lamb risen and he has become the lion of the tribe of judah before the chapter ends in verse 27 all the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the lord all the kindreds of the nation shall worship Worship before thee, for the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. The time is coming. I pray that when that time comes, you will reign with the Lord in Jesus' name. To him belongs all power. To him belongs all majesty. And I pray that nothing will hinder you from worshiping of the people of God on that final day in Jesus' name. Psalm 66, I'm reading from verse 4. Psalm 66, verse 4. All the earth shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee, and they shall sing to thy name. And you see what they were singing, and you see what you'll be singing when you join the redeemed of the Lord on that final day. Because it tells us that when every creature which is in heaven, and when every creature that is on earth, when every creature under the earth, and all the creatures that are in the sea, and all that are in them, when they heard, John heard them, what were they saying? Blessing and honor, and glory and power. Be unto him that sits upon the throne, that is unto the ancient of days, unto God Almighty and 
unto the Lamb forever and ever. And that praise had begun many years before. That praise had been coming little by little, little by little, among the people of God, among the Levites, among the priests of God, and among the Israelites. And eventually, it's increasing, increasing, until it comes to that point in Revelation. Let me show you a part of it as uh, the people of God who are worshipping God in the Old Testament. And they were using that similar language in First Chronicles chapter 29. First Chronicles chapter 29, reading from verse 11. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted head above all, both riches and honor. Come of thee and thou reignest over all. And in thine hand is power and might. And in thine hand it is to make great and in thy hand to give strength unto all. Now, therefore, O Lord, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. When you come to Psalm 72, come to Psalm 72 and look at verse 18 and see how the praise continues. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only doeth wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever, and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. In Romans chapter 11, it continues now uh, to the New Testament. In Romans chapter 11, reading from verse 33. Romans 11, reading from verse 33. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the might of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has First given to him, and it shall be recompensed to him again for him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever and ever. In Romans chapter 16, verse 27. Romans chapter 16, verse 27. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. In First Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6, verses 15. And 16, it says, which in his time he has shown, who is the blessed and the only potentate, king of kings and lord of lords, who only has immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. And then he tells us in Jude, verse 25, Jude Verse 25, it tells us here, still ascribing praise and glory to the Lord, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty and dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Revelation chapter 15, verse 4. Revelation chapter 15, reading there in verse 4, it tells us, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord? And glorify thy name, for thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. You see today, as we look, as we have looked at this Revelation chapter five, that Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, that he is the one that will reign over the kingdoms of the earth. When you read in the Matthew, Luke, and Mark, and John, and you see how he carried the cross. And he was falling under the cross. And the women were weeping because of him. And he said, don't weep for me, but weep for yourself. And then he appeared on the trial, at the time of the trial. And he said, are you the king of the Jews? And he said, thou says, he says, you will see the son of man coming at the right hand of power, coming in the clouds. And that time is about to come. And when that time comes, you will not be on the earth to suffer the great tribulation. You will be in heaven. You will be with the redeemed of the Lord. You will be there. When the announcement will be made. Who is worthy to take the book. Out of the hand of the almighty God. 
And then you will find that immediately nobody comes out. And like John, you'll be sorrowfully little. Then you will remember this study of the word of God, that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, that was slain to take the sins of the world away, that has redeemed us, that he is the worthy one. And in front of you there, he will come out and take the book out of the hand of the Almighty God. And then will you see the redeemed of the Lord, and you'll be one of them. And I will be one of them. And the angels will be there. And we will all begin to sing. Maybe you don't know how to sing now. Your voice will change. Your voice will be redeemed. You'll have resurrection voice. And you'll have a transformed voice. And you will sing with the redeemed of the Lord on that day. And then you will be singing that worthy is the Lamb. Because he's the one that has received power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And then the rest of the universe will join you. Will it not be glorious on that day? Whatever it will take for you to make it at the rapture. A little self-denial now. A little resistance to the devil now. Resisting temptation now. Saying no to the devil. No to the flesh. And no to sin. And being washed in the blood of the Lamb. So that when the trumpet shall sound and the saints of God shall go marching in by the grace of of God, you will be there. And I will be there. And then we'll be before the Lord. And then we'll tell the story how we have overcome. I will be there. You will be there. Rise up and tell the Lord. You are going to prepare yourself. Without holiness, no man shall save the Lord. Without the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb, you will not be able to make it. Without redemption and forgiveness and purging and transformation. Being a new creature in Christ, without that, you will not be there. Why don't you tell the Lord, O oh Lord, purge me. O oh Lord, cleanse me. O oh Lord, prepare me. O oh Lord, make me holy. O oh Lord, make me righteous. Sanctify me. Purify me. Prepare me. So that on that day, when the saints of God go mad, marching in. When the saints of God go marching in, I will be there. Tell the Lord you will be there. Don't allow anything. Don't allow anything to hinder you. Don't allow anything to hinder you. It may soon take place. At this time now, there may be tribulation, there may be trial, there may be temptation. But you tell the Lord, oh Lord, keep me by your grace. Oh Lord, help me by your grace. Hold me by your right hand of might, right hand of power, that I will not fall into sin. And then on that day, when the trumpet shall sound, by and by, by and by, when the morning comes, when the saints of God are gathered home, then will you tell the story that we have overcome, where we'll understand it better, by and by. When the saints of God will join together and they'll be worshiping the Lord. Will you not be there? Will you not be there? When the church triumphant, when they'll be singing, Worthy is the Lamb. When throughout all of heaven, the praises of God will be ringing, Worthy is the Lamb. When the thrones and the paths before him will be bending and the order sweet with voice ascending, swell chorus never ending. Will you not sing with the redeemed of the Lord? Worthy is the Lamb. Every kindred and every tongue and every nation will be singing at that time, Worthy is the Lamb. Why will you not join them to sing of that great salvation and say, Worthy is the Lamb? Loud as mighty thunders roaring, floods of mighty waters pouring, prostrate at his feet adoring. Everybody will be shouting, Worthy is the Lamb. The harps and the songs will be ever sounding. The mighty grace of God that overcomes sin abounding in our lives by the blood of the Lamb. He has bought us. Wandering from the fold, he sought us. And to glory safely, he is bringing us. And we're going to sing together with the rest of the people of God. Worthy is the Lamb. Sing with blessed anticipation. Through the veil of tribulation, sweetest notes, all notes excelling. On the theme forever dwelling, still untold. Though ever telling, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb, the Lamb of God, the host of heaven will sing it. The throne, uh, the, the, uh, the people of God will sing it in heaven. Heaven will ring with the praises of the people of God. Multitudes, multitudes, innumerable people, will you not be among them when the book is opened wide? When Jesus Christ, the crucified lamb, the slain lamb, and the risen lamb, and the powerful mighty lion of the tribe of Judah. When everybody will be singing to him, will you not be there? Why don't you give yourself to the Lord if you have not been born again? And say, Lord, I give myself to you. I give myself to you. I don't want to miss it on that final day. Are you children of God? Remain in the Lord. Don't allow anything to drive you away from the fold of the Lord. And then when everything is over. And when history is concluded, and we all sing in heaven, then you will be there by and by, by and by, when the morning comes, 
When the saints of God are gathered home, we will tell the story. How we have overcome what you don't understand now, we will understand it better by and by.